Hey everyone, my name is Ben Strothman, also known as Honey LeBronx, the vegan drag queen. Um, I made this video eight weeks ago, almost two months ago, um, in response to the COVID crisis, specifically as it, it's affecting the gay community. Um, I was really upset with some of the behaviors I was seeing in the gay community. The fact that guys are still hooking up. But during a pandemic, when people can be asymptomatic and still spread some... You know what? I'm not going to go into the who, what, where, when, why of COVID. I put together a panel um, with uh, a doctor and two nurses, all of whom deal specifically with gay men and gay men's sexual health, uh, to discuss COVID from the point of view of how it affects the gay community. Um, I want to apologize to everyone who took part in this. My computer died. Apple didn't think that they could fix it. Shout out to my friend Jesus completely recovering my iMac and all the files on it. God loves drag queens, like I always say. So my apologies on how delayed this information is. I certainly feel it would have been more fitting. Uh, and more timely if I had released this right away, like June 1st, Pride Month. The thing that inspired me to make this video in the first place was, I'm sure we all remember the Meth Gala, where uh, 35 or so people were gathered in a house with a DJ, no masks, no social distancing. I reached out and talked to one of these people because I saw them doing an interview with Shishi Luru, and this person seemed, seemed, genuinely remorseful, at least by comparison to the other apology videos we'd seen. And so this person reached out to me afterwards to thank me for what I had to contribute to the conversation. And I really wanted to put together this panel and include this person on the panel so that they can sit there and learn from this conversation and use their platform to get the word out. I wanted to present this person with an opportunity to right this wrong. Because everyone who commented, some people were suggesting that they go and volunteer their time at like a food bank, but I don't think that does anything to repair the damage that these people have done. Come get educated, come find out what's factually wrong with their understanding of COVID, and now use their platform to spread that information. Use their platform even to share this video. I basically heard back from them. They don't believe COVID is as bad as it is. It's just like the flu. They don't think wearing a mask prevents you from getting it. It's only old people and sick people dying from it. I'm sharing this in hopes that that person might like hear something new and be like, I didn't think about it that way. That's a good point. Least I can do is wear a mask and socially distance. Two, maybe three weeks ago, I'm looking at this person's Instagram live. They're at another house party, this time with even more people there. And I recognize the view from the window of this apartment because I'm realizing they're in my apartment building. My building had put, put every safeguard and precaution in place back before people were even doing that. We've done a fantastic job of keeping this building secure. I don't care what your little beliefs are. Have whatever beliefs you have, but what you're not going to do is bring a hundred people into my apartment building and undo everything that we fought for and touch our elevator buttons and cough and breathe and put your hands on the glass of our revolving door the lobby. How dare you? How dare you? Here I am. Alexa, how many days has it been since March 12th? March 12, 2020 was 130 days ago. 130 days. I've been sitting in my apartment. No socializing. No human contact. Not a hug. Sitting here wondering if I will ever get to see my family again. Do you get that? But it's more important to you to party and take it upon yourself to take liberties with my health. You don't get to do that. In the meantime, we also had a fleet of gay men flooding Fire Island, dancing, shirts off, not social distancing, no mask. I, j I don't understand. Guys, this is, this is no time for random hookups in my old apartment building. 
on West 45th Street between 10th and 11th. I just saw a mass text advertising some drug-fueled anonymous group sex party in their apartment, in my old building. I can't get away from you motherfuckers. I'm trying, here I am, just sitting here with my wigs and my clutter, trying to stay safe and keep my, my lungs, the only two I'm ever gonna get, and stay healthy so that I can see my family again as soon as this is over, whenever that is. And here you guys are going to Fire Island and rubbing on each other and hooking up and going to sex parties and having house parties. I do hope you'll sit and you'll watch because a lot of these questions I asked the doctor and the two nurses, I asked them on your behalf. And I asked them after speaking with you and finding out exactly your understanding of this pandemic and all of your yeah buts, how abouts and what ifs. I asked all those questions for you. I'm, I'm, I'm mad as hell whether I seem it or not. Um, but even this, even this video and, and, and having this panel conversation was, in my part, an attempt to reach out to those people who were doing these things in hopes of getting the information to them. How naive, how terminally optimistic of me to think that it was just a matter of them not having the info. I'm shocked uh, to realize as the months tick on that people actually don't care. I don't, I don't understand not caring. Maybe that's why I'm vegan in the first place, but I don't understand not caring. I just don't. I guess that's everything I have to say. You can find me all social media at Honey LeBronx. You can find my website, vegandragqueen.com. But today, all I'm asking you to do is hear out these medical experts, get up to date on whatever information, and use whatever platforms you have to spread this information so that at least everyone can like get brought up to being on the same page about understanding what they need to do, specifically from the point of view of gay men and their sexual health. Thanks for watching. Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Honey LeBronx, the vegan drag queen, of course. And uh, I've got a panel of doctors today for us to speak with about COVID, specifically as it pertains to gay men's sexual health um, and uh, what we all need to know now. So uh, would you guys like to, I see you in order, uh, Jason, David, Jeffrey. So Jason, why don't you just start by introducing yourselves to the listeners and who you are and what your experience is? Um, so my name's Jason Villarreal, and I think it's interesting you said you had a few doctors. I'm actually a nurse practitioner. Um, so I, uh, which we do, um, I do, my, my normal work is uh, primary care at a, a clinic serving people living with HIV and um, non-PrEP, um, and we also do infectious disease. Um, so that's, that's really been my kind of main day-to-day -day work. Um, I'm at, at Columbia, New York city. Um, and you know, we've been really, um, uh, kind of at the epicenter of what's been going on clinically, uh, with, with COVID. So we've been seeing a lot, um, and I'm looking forward to having these conversations. Um, and these are conversations we've already had. I've had with a lot of, uh, the people I serve, um, who mainly tend to be people of color um, on the GLBTQ kind of continuum. So um, just looking forward to this conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. If you had said, like, I'm actually, uh, I do carpentry and light painting, I would have felt like, oh my God, I was way off. But like, <laughs> doctor, nurse, peanut butter, jelly. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time and for being here today. Um, and how about you, David? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is David Malbranch. I am a, an, a board certified internal medicine uh, physician. I'm an associate professor at Morehouse School of Medicine, but currently I'm actually in upstate New York, uh, near Broad Albin, New York. I'm kind of stuck here with the COVID-19 thing that's been happening, and I'm on an extended leave of absence. We'll probably be getting back to Atlanta in sometime in July, but uh, probably for the past two decades, I've been doing a lot of work with HIV and STI prevention um, and treatment, uh, particularly among black men who have sex with men in the South. Uh, so I've been focusing on that. I also do sexual health, correctional health, uh, student and college age, age health. So all these things um, kind of are part of my wheelhouse. And I also do a lot of work uh, with COVID-19 for the past couple months, been on a lot of webinars, 
um, articles, podcasts, kind of keeping up to date with what's going on. And I've been hustling and making ends meet by doing a lot of telemedicine. So I've actually been seeing a lot of patients, not on the front lines per se, but uh, more so in the telemedicine space, which has been an interesting experience as well. So I'm just honored and happy to be here with you today. Thank you. I have uh, my doctor's appointment in early June, and I was so looking forward to seeing him again. And then I found out it's going to be video. And I think I'm going to cry because I just have the most wonderful doctor. I'm going to be like, I just want to give you a hug. Uh, but I love that I have a gay doctor so I can talk about I remember when, I, when they were giving me a new doctor, they were like, do you, do you matter the gender? And I wanted to sound so woke and PC. Like, no, gender doesn't matter. I'm like, yes, I want a dude. Like, I want a guy who I can be like, hey, yes. you know how like yes. after the guy gets off and blah, 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 it's just so <laughs> nice having that relatedness. Yeah, representation truly matters in that respect because you're yeah. making yourself so vulnerable and you're in a, in, in a vulnerable space so you want to feel safe. So when someone who can really understand what you're going through, it, it does help out a lot. I also grew up um, very aware of and sensitive to um, how women have suffered at the hands of men. And so growing up, like once I went through puberty and became a dude underneath all of this, became like a dude, I felt very apologetic for my maleness. Like, like I was like a predator, you know? And so there's even, there's a part of me that like around women, like, oh, I don't want to talk about sex. They're so delicate. I need to get over that. But I don't think I would be able to be as open as I am with my <laughs> Dusty. If you're watching, you're just the best. Well, thank you. And uh, Jeffrey, could I have you uh, tell us about yourself as well? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here uh, today. So I'm Jeff Kwong, and I'm also a nurse practitioner located here in New York City. And um, I'm also a professor in the Division of Advanced Practice Nursing at Rutgers University. Um, in terms of my clinical practice, so I practice at a uh, internal medicine practice, mostly HIV, um, primary care, LGBT health, um, right there on 14th and 8th. So um, right in the heart of, heart of it all. So, Oof, yeah. Where I used to go to the College of Acupuncture, I, was, I went once for what was called Grand Rounds. I did not go to medical school. I don't know what Grand Rounds is. It sounds like a Pillsbury product. And this was for, I could never tell a doctor exactly what happened. They're like, how exactly did you injure your tailbone? And I was just like, I was sitting down really hard on a workout bench while holding 250 pound. I'm like, that simulates what happened. And I went in for grand rounds and they did acupuncture like on like right on the tail. Like they basically had to go in. I didn't realize, I thought I was walking into like a little office. I was like, no, you're walking into a theater. There were cameras. It was very much like, oh, I didn't know I was filming that kind of a video today. But so 14th and 8th, I know it well. So um, just to sort of give some context for why I wanted to have this conversation today, specifically with people in the medical profession who deal specifically with gay men's sexual health issues, um, I have been seeing during the whole shelter at home thing, I've been saying, seeing some people say they should close down the apps. Why is Grindr and Scruff, why are these apps open? We should shut those down. I love that they're open because some of my like um, sex partners in, in the neighborhood, I like still being able to keep in touch with them and check in on them and be like, hey, how are, you know, it's not often that we touch in with each other on an emotional level. And so it's been great for even chatting with neighbors. I, li I live in a huge residential building, so I can kind of keep in touch with my neighbors and people in, in my community. But to my horror, I have started seeing few and far between at first and now as the weeks have gone on more and more and more gay men still hooking up with each other during the covid crisis and you know i if you ever see my my scruff profile it, it's a novella i mean it it i could basically it has an isbn number and i found that like i can only thumb type for so many hours to get this information out to people um, and I, so I thought this would be a better way to do it. So if, if nothing else, I can make a link and be like, here, watch this video, get the facts. But one of the things that kept coming up 
is people would say, oh, I got to stop pounding the table because probably when people would say like, oh, it's okay. I already had COVID. So I have the antibodies. So I'm immune. So that means I can't get it. So that means you can't get it from me. And so that means I can't spread it. Is that true? And who has something to say about that? And who wants to go first? I nominate Jeff. <laughs> sure. So, you know, I think at, at this point, I think there's so much that is, um, that we're still learning that there that is being discovered, you know, moment by moment, hour by hour. So right now, I think what we need to say is that, yes, there are antibodies that are detectable on tests, but just the significance of those antibodies, we do not know if they are protective against future infection. Where people can get reinfected, people can get reinfected. So, um, you know, what I tell and counsel my folks are, you know, knowing your antibody status, it's it's something to know. But um, just in terms of how you interact with other people, you still need to follow all the same public health rules that everybody else is following. So, social distancing, wearing a mask, washing your hands, all of those things still apply. Because at this point, we really don't know. That's that's how I think. And I think that there's um, another issue is that we don't know if everybody who has COVID makes an antibody. Um, and at least in New York, there was, there has been, and still kind of is in the city um, really difficult to get testing. So a lot of people say, I, I know I had it in March or February or April. We don't actually know that because we couldn't test as many people. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that it's, it's, it's important to kind of know that. So, I mean, I actually, I had the flu in January and it felt like COVID, but um, it was, it was the flu. So I think that's really important to kind of keep, keep track of. Um, and I, I'm saying all this now and I agree everything with Jeff said, and I think it's also going to be important. That's kind of like, that's the bad news. I feel, I think we also need to be able to talk about, this isn't all that I'm saying and all that I'm thinking, but I think it's important that, what Jeff says is true. We don't know a lot. I, I speak with a lot of infectious disease doctors that literally are in my little cubicle and all the people, the smartest people in the room always will be able to say, I don't know, or we don't know, or this is unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's people who are saying whether, whether they're politicians or medical people who are saying, this is true, this is definite. That's not correct because there's so much we don't know. This, this virus in its current iteration is about six months old or so. Um, that in terms of kind of the human experience of it. So I think no one can say that we know for sure. So that's, yeah. I think that's, that's kind of the, the downer news that I tell people. That's kind of everything that Jeff said plus that. I really appreciate your saying that because I'm going to say something that probably will um, ruffle some feathers. But in my experience, when I, like, I talk about sexual health so much on apps and it really bothers me when I say, when I see people who say in their profile, STD free. Yeah. Cause I'm like, first of all, it's not, and by the way, I've never really had a chance to talk to people in like the, the medical field about like, okay, can you verify this for me? If, if anything, if, if I'm, if I'm lying, please say that's actually not true. Cause I would love to know that this is correct. But I tell them, first of all, it's not an STD. It's an STI. It's an infection, not a disease, right? Like, Cancer is a disease. Syphilis is an infection. Is that accurate, would you say? Yeah. yeah. And that's why we call it an STI. Okay. So, and saying it's an STD, even calling it a disease, I think that adds stigma to having an STI. But the other thing I say to people is I'm like, you can't guarantee that you're STI free. They're like, yeah, I can. I just got tested last month. Yeah. And here's, here's how I've decided to go in. I'm like, for what? And they're like, for STI. So I'm like, which ones? And they're like, well, all of them. I'm like, no, you did not. Because there is not a test for, there isn't the all, like if it turns blue, it's all of them. There's not a <laughs> test for all of them. They pick which ones to test you for, which ones were you tested for? And they're like, well, gosh, I don't know. And I'm like, well, isn't that interesting? You're guaranteeing me which infections you don't have and you don't know which ones you've been tested for. Let's start there. But what I wanted to say that will ruffle some feathers is in my experience, the people who usually have the worst attitude or the worst information about that are the people who are in some way in the medical field. They're like, oh, I'm a nurse. I know all of this. I, I don't, I, I, I'm sorry if that sounds awful, but it's always people who 
think like, oh, I already know everything because it, this is where they work. Um, so so that you say the smartest people are those who can say, I don't know. I really appreciate hearing that. David, what about you? I know I, I, I spoke out of turn. No, 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 no. I, I agree with all that uh, Jeff and Jason both said. I think I would add to that, you know, when people go to get STI checked, even for gay men, and when we go to get checked up for routine screening, we got, you know, we have swabs in our asses, swabs down our throat, you know, we're peeing in a cup, we're getting blood tests or finger sticks done. But we often don't test for herpes because it's not a good screening test because the prevalence is so high, especially for type one. Um, anywhere you could find 60 to 70% of the population has been exposed to it. It's just going to freak people out. So it is humorous when you see people say, well, I'm STI free. Yeah. And you're like, well, did you get checked for herpes? And they're like, I don't know. They just told me everything looked clean. And they use that phrase too, which is always interesting. So, you know, I, th I think it's one of those things where there are a lot of parallels that can be drawn with COVID-19 and HIV and things that we've learned from the HIV epidemic yeah. um, and how we handled it over time up until now. And the same thing can be said for STI. So it's interesting, even with the antibody tests that Jason is talking about, there are so many different types of antibody tests. And when they first started to develop them, the regulations were kind of stripped. So you had all these really awful tests yeah. that had high false positivity rates and false yeah. negativity rates and all these other things that were, you know, diagnosing people as being exposed to COVID-19 when they weren't or missing it when they actually were. So it's important to also know, especially this early in the game, when we still don't know, and we're still flying by the seat of our pants, that people need to take a, a, a chill pill and kind of step back a little bit and say, hey, we don't know what kind of test is this, and then find out what the antibody test is. Ha has it been approved? Has it been vetted? Uh, has it been studied extensively? And then know from there. But I think, you know, the reflection among gay men wanting to be intimate, wanting to be connected, uh, wanting to resume some sense of normalcy, whatever that means, is kind of a microcosm of the way the country, and you see what's been happening this weekend uh, from Memorial Day weekend, where people are just kind of running out, and it's like in a state like Alabama or Georgia or Texas, where the rates are either you know, plateauing or they're going up. People are running around with no masks, like there's nothing going on. I've seen friends of mine die. I've seen friends of mine get sick of it uh, from COVID-19. And I'm trying to tell people like, this is no joke. Like, and it may not show up for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So you say you feel fine right now, but just be really, really careful out there. It doesn't mean anything if you feel fine right now. And I think that it's important. Um, I, I have actually, in English or Spanish, I will stop a patient or a colleague or anybody mid sentence if they use the word clean. Right. Because that's that's not, I say, wait, clean means you took a shower today. I hope you took a shower today, but if you didn't, you know, I still see the patient, whatever. Yeah. But that's that's a full stop. And I feel like that's already happening on online. Um, you know, people... I. I, I, you know, I've seen people advertise on Facebook. I got the antibody. They're posting the picture of their, their test. And I'm seeing just many of these people didn't live through the early days of HIV. And so they're, they're doing this whole, they're already starting immediately to say I'm clean, even if they're not saying the word. And I get where the, the, the impulse is, you know, um, you were talking about, um, people in other parts of the country saying they want to open up the beaches or the churches or stuff like that. And here everybody in New York is kind of laughing at them and mocking them and saying, you're awful, you're evil. And yet we all have these desires. We want to get, we want to come together in church or on a beach or for a cookout or for sex. And I think we have to be very frank about that and say sex is crucial as is going to church for some people, as is going to a theater for some people. So how do, how does that look like? And I think that, the, I'm, I'm guessing we may get to this at some point in the conversation, but I really kind of am starting to look at how does harm reduction, how does safer sex that we've all learned to kind of understand, how does that inform what we're, we're going through now? Because I think there are so many parallels to things that have happened in the past. And I don't want to in any way equate this to the HIV when epidemic when it started and kind of how it's, it's progressed. But I think we can learn a lot from that and also kind of accept that, you know, I don't think it's reasonable to say to people, you can't have sex until we have a vaccine. Like that's just not going to work. So we need to have those conversations. I think, um, you know, David, you said it um, as well. Uh, Jason, I definitely appreciate the, uh, your contribution. You know, I think that the key thing is really, it's just that need for intimacy that I think everybody is, is feeling. I mean, even if I, you know, I'm sheltering in place with my partner, but I still feel like I need to be intimate in other ways with other people just to have that interaction. And, um, and I think everybody's feeling that. And, uh, you know, I think that's making people 
um, we, we need to sort of find out a new way to, to do that in sort of this era. And, you know, um, just as Jason said, sort of a harm reduction approach or sort of doing it in a different way um, doesn't mean you can't interact with other people, but, you know, um, if you want to be in the same room and have mutual masturbation or do something along those, along those ways, whatever floats your boat, like that's a, that's a thing that, uh, you know, yeah, and, and people have been really people have been really concerned about it too because they've seen these studies. One of the things that's been interesting with COVID nineteen is because it's such a new virus and we've just been learning as we go along. You see the the publication of or not even the publication but the preprinting of data before it's been peer reviewed and then it's splashed in the media as truth and everybody runs with it, which is crazy. And so we've seen these studies about you know yeah the 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 novel coronavirus can be found. Um, in the anus and in fecal matter. It can be found, remnants of it can be found in semen. So people are always asking, can I eat somebody's ass? And am I gonna get COVID-19 from that? Or if I take somebody, somebody nuts in my mouth or nuts in my ass, if we do it raw, is this gonna give me COVID-19? And the thing is, it's just cause you find remnants or find the virus, detect the virus in those things. A lot of viruses do shed in the feces. A lot of viruses are trackable in the semen weeks after people resolve the clinical illness. Does that necessarily mean that you will become exposed to it or get a clinical syndrome? We don't know. And so, you know, a lot of people are really trying to be precautious, but then you're getting all this widely ranging information that's flying about and it hasn't properly been peer reviewed. We don't always know what it means clinically because you can say something and you don't know what the clinical Im implications mean. So I think it's really tough. And whenever somebody says to me, well, like, God, people are getting so hysterical about this. Why are they getting hysterical? And I'm like, they have every reason to be hysterical because you're getting conflicting news every day. Yeah. You're getting evolving news every day. You have government officials and politicians that are saying something that goes directly against the science. If I'm a lay person and I'm, you know, I have public health degree, I have a physician's degree. I, you know, I get confused sometimes looking at this. I'm like, what the hell? I can't keep up with all this stuff. I can't even imagine for someone who, who hasn't had my training and hasn't um, gotten a lot of that education um, where they would think with all this. And so I think it's, you can be scared a little bit or you can have a healthy amount of fear. Um, but I, I try to advise people not to be hysterical to the point where it paralyzes you because we still have to live as Jason was saying, people still need to have sex. We use sex as coping all the time. So sex has to be a part of it as well as, you know, as we do with working out or going to the gym or doing drugs or eating or gambling, all those things are kind of coping mechanisms. And the fact that we've been physically distancing ha has really kind of taken a toll on a lot of people, particularly gay men. And what you see right now are people just acting out because they're tired of it. And David, uh, to, to your point, it's like our friend Priyambada said when she was a guest on my on my podcast, stress weakens the immune system. And so, yes, you can freak out and yes, you can be on high alert. And I don't think that we're used, I don't think that we really recognize in this country that stress weakening the immune system is a thing because we don't regard ourselves holistically. Like we don't think of ourselves as that, you know, and, and so you have to not freak out. Like you have to take this. And this is also why I'm like, you have to be able to laugh at stuff. As a drag queen, we take things that should not be laughed at and we find a way to laugh at them because if we can, it, it helps us cope and it helps us not stay too stressed. And I think also it's important to remember that every person is going through it. So um, the, sometimes the reaction to stress is to lash out. And I don't think that that helps anybody. It just creates this kind of negative energy. It creates this negative, um, kind of inflammation. And then, then, and then it leads to the spread of more. You, you're grasping at one little article or as, as David said, like something that has pre-printed and hasn't been reviewed and somebody thinks that's the gospel or the law or, and that's not, and then, and then immediately shaming, like saying, you know, you're evil because you had sex or you're evil because you went for a walk in the park. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's understandable where that comes from, I think, in terms of mental health. But I think it's important that everybody try to take a step back and be easy on themselves and on other people and kind of try and see, you know, how do we, how do we continue to live in this situation and, and have sex, specifically sex. So um, can I ask you, um, I mean, I, I feel like I'm one of those who I've had the opposite reaction. The, um, the chakra for creativity and the chakra for sex 
they come from the same place. So I can just as easily be very sexual and very horny, or if I give myself a creative task that I want to throw myself into for two months, I can completely not think about sex. So for me, thinking about sex is just, I just kind of turned off that switch. I realized not everyone can do that that easily, but um, I think it was the Netherlands I heard that they were saying, hey, it's coming this way to prepare people should quarantine with a like with a fuck buddy everyone should get a intimate partner and quarantine with them or or just see them and no one else i i feel like it's probably too late here to do that but um how would you guys say people could safely go about doing that if, if they if want to have a partner i think it's i think it goes again to the harm reductionist kind of mindset um and again, sometimes I hear people saying, no offense to anybody, even present company, but somebody to say, you know, I have, they say they, they're with their partner. That is obviously lowest risk because if they're living with one person or a few people, and these are the, the people they have sex with, if one or the other is, has gotten COVID, especially in New York, they they may have already had it. It's already kind of run its course through everybody, maybe. But, you know, that's not as easy to hear when you're someone like me who lives by himself. So... I think a harm reductionist could say having a sex party in this particular moment in time right now is a lot is a lot riskier on the continuum. And we're talking a different kind of risk. So we've always talked historically um, about syphilis risk or HIV risk or things of that nature. And it's kind of paradoxical because syphilis or HIV are not deadly, whereas COVID might be. And it might not be to you. It might be to the person at the grocery store that because you, you have to go to the grocery store, whatever, those kinds of things. Um, so maybe having a big group sex in that situation is more risky than having sex with one person or with two people that you normally do and that you've all is maybe you have the antibody. Does that mean anything? We don't know. We think it does. If you just kind of extrapolate based on other coronaviruses, which are very common, and this being a kind of a novel one that's been much more effective because of various things of its structure. But I think that that's even within New York City, the, the Department of Health put out a, a little kind of a little poster saying, you know, trying to talk about sex with yourself or video, that's actually, that's on the harm reductionist, that's the least risky having sex with one partner or with somebody that you know very well and consistently, that's a little bit more on the risk, but that's less risky all the way to the other end is not kind of the group. So, and that's, that's the same entire, but looking at it differently of saying, what is the infectiousness of this virus and what, it, what could it mean? So I think that those are the conversations that we have to have with ourselves and with each other, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, uh, I mean, to go back to your comment about the, the Netherlands with, where they're talking about pairing up or finding somebody. Um, just anecdotally, I saw a patient last week who met a new partner um, and they uh, met sort of during this whole thing at the very beginning of March, just online on one of the apps. And they, you know, kind of had conversations and have since, um, you know, they met social distancing in the park, got to sort of chat a little bit. They kind of um, consummated their, their relationship and, and now, Sort of social distance together, or they're sheltering in place together. So, mm -hmm. um, but it's happening here. So, mm -hmm. um, just anecdotally. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like the harm reduction point that Jason is bringing across, and that's been talked about a lot. And again, it, it's not a. I didn't like at the beginning where people were equating it to HIV at the beginning. I was like, okay, let's not. That's apples and oranges. But there are some parallels of some different things. And I was speaking to a friend of mine. And I mean, we have to be mindful that um, HIV or a weakened immune system is not always the highest comorbidity, risky comorbidity to hospitalization and death. Uh, that study in JAMA with like, I think 5,600 people showed that the top three were hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. And I had a friend in Newark who had all three of those things. He got COVID, had symptoms. And I asked him, he hadn't told any of his family. I said, why didn't you tell members of your family? He really just trusted me and wanted to talk, me, talk to me about it and get some advice about what he could do. But he said, I was scared that I was going to be judged. And I was scared. He was like, because David, I did everything I thought was right. He's like, I wore masks when I went out. 
I washed my hands. I stayed uh, physically distanced from people at least six feet when I was there. And I still got it. And I felt like people were going to blame me. And I was like, oh my God, it sounds exactly the way HIV has gone. Yeah. And even if, you know, whether you wear condoms or you, you just stay with one partner or you don't wear condoms or whatever, there's a certain amount of shaming that people are getting afraid of doing. And to Jason's point with the, with the harm reduction, people are shaming other people for going outside and not wearing masks. And I was like, well, if they're not wearing masks, but they're not really close to anybody, that may be okay, but it's kind of like this hierarchy of judgment. And I guess it's just human nature at this point that you know, regardless of whether it's HIV, STIs, or COVID-19, we feel a, a need to judge people who don't handle their own personal health the same way we do. Um, and so there are a lot of unknowns here. So I think we have to be careful about a judgmental approach. And like Jason said, go back to a, you know, a harm reduction model where people are going to go out, people are going to have sex, people are going to get into crowded bars and pools and all these other things. So just try to educate people, but don't, the last thing people need at the end of the day is the judgment. Um, they don't need that. And if, if it's meant to be that they are careless, if you want to use that word with what they do and they end up contracting COVID-19 and get sick, then that's on them. But you can't always police that. It's not like we're, we're not the condom police when we do sexual health. Um, and I don't consider myself the condom police with sexual health. I try to, you know, mitigate whatever it is and make them enjoy, have people enjoy uh, sex as much as they can, um, but then be mindful of what's going on. And I think the same approach is helpful here. Um, you don't want to try to control people to say, you can't do this, or I'm going to paternalistically wave my finger at you and you're going to get COVID-19 and die. Um, but we have to have some empathy with that because People are dealing with a lot of human beings right now. Can, can I ask you guys something? This is uh, sort of taking a step away from the harm reduction um, and more just cl uh, clarifying information. You know, in my, uh, you know, uh, listen, my dad got me a simulated brain surgery video game when I was in seventh grade. So like, it's not like I know nothing about the medical field. I do know how to operate for a cerebral aneurysm and a subdural hematoma. Like th wow. this is something that I, I know how to do. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. I uh, know, right? <laughs> if you're in an elevator with me and Jason and you have a cerebral aneurysm and like I have a butter knife and a paper clip, <laughs> you're still gonna die, but at least I'll have an objective. I'm like, here's what we gotta do. Um, but uh, some of the things that I'm realizing um, and I wanna dispel, I, I wanna get the correct information out there. So. Someone says, oh, it's okay. And I have a, um, you know, fuck buddy in the neighborhood who was like, oh, come on over. It's okay. I already had coronavirus. I recovered. I tested positive for the antibodies. Well, I don't think what people realize is that like, there are five different isotypes of human antibodies and they don't all have the same job. Kind of like with sperm cells, not every sperm cell goes in search of an ovum. Some form a barricade. Some attack foreign sperm, like they all have different jobs. So are these antibody tests telling us which isotype of antibody we have? I know of. <laughs> yeah, no, I, mean, I don't think it, they do unless you look on the package insert. I don't know whether uh, Jeff yeah. or Jason have any. And, and, and as, as David said earlier, the, we are just getting all the antibody tests out and uh, many of them don't quantify. There's some question about is, is there a certain quantity that you need for it to be protective? Most of them, as far as I know, that we've, I've seen don't have that. Yeah. Uh, we're, again, we're still very, very, very early. And so many tests have come out and people are, it's almost like a competition who can post on Facebook first a positive antibody. And I'm like, you know, some of these are at some, they're through a, through a, a company or through somewhere, who knows where, and we just don't know. So I think there's a whole lot, of, again, going back to, you know, hopefully months from now, a year from now, we'll be able to look back on this and say, oh, I remember that time when we didn't know because by then we might know, but we just don't know right now. Sure, sure. And I think that's also, you know, a very important point. And I tell that to folks when I'm uh, talking to them or counseling them about the antibody test is, I do say right off the bat, I go, so first thing you need to also know is that the tests that I can order for you are not F currently not FDA approved. So... Um, and I think that's an important thing for people to know. Um, I mean, they, they try to validate them as best they, they can, but again, I think, you know, just in terms of trying to get things to market quickly, um, to, you know, in terms of the, the rigor, in, I know, I can, I can tell you for sure, um, just in my patient panel, um, 
there were um, a couple of instances already where people have had false, ne uh, false negative tests. So people who definitely were symptomatic, they part they quarantined with their partner. One partner tested positive, and the other one was negative. And I'm like, well, I don't think you're. I, I think you're probably positive too. So then they got retested with another thing, and they were positive. So. Now, can I ask you guys, um, are we seeing, you know, I, I've, been, I've been hearing that there are people who recover from COVID, test positive for antibodies, and still manage to get reinfected. Is that actually happening? Are we seeing that? I don't mean like hypothetically, or we've read about it. Have any of you actually seen that well, yet? We've seen, there's, I think there's a difference. There's a question of, is someone being reinfected or is somebody, is a test still showing viral fragments that are not believed to be infective? Um, mm -hmm. And I've had patients that they're coming back uh, positive two month or two after they had like zero symptoms, everything's feel clinically cleared up. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I know when I don't know, so I went to one of my colleagues who's like an infectious disease guru. And he, he says, well, first of all, we don't know. That was the first thing he said, who's like a guru. And then second one, he says, but we really, I really think that this is probably a fragment, a viral fragment that's not infective, that can't infect somebody else. And it's, it's, just, it's just a tiny fragment that's being picked up on the test. That's what we think. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen many, I haven't seen anybody in my, my, so far my experience who's been doubly affected. Now, that being said, I couldn't test them for the first time. So who knows? But even like uh, the studies that are coming out of China, North, uh, South Korea, that they think that these people, people were reinfected. They did follow up. They said, well, this was so close after a negative test that showed up positive. Some of them are retesting again negative, like, like Jeff's patient. Um, some of them, and the, again, they all, and in those patients, they said, we still don't think that that is a, a, a viable virus that's, that can infect other people. We don't know. We don't think so. That's, that's what people, mm -hmm. are. that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. So that's it's, hard, it's hard because I, I think a lot of people are looking for 100% certainty. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, is that particularly in the medical field, that's hard to come by. Uh, like it's rare that you can make an 100% guarantee. And like we've all been talking about here, if somebody says that they probably don't know what the hell they're talking mm -hmm. about, if they always are making 100% guarantees because medicine is an uncertain science. And so whether it be with antibodies where antibodies may indicate that you've been exposed, but do they confer immunity or protection? That's the question that we really don't know. Like, and even the tests that aren't 100% accurate, we don't even know that if the positive is positive, is it a true positive or are you cross-reacting to another virus that you got exposed to at some earlier time? We just don't know. And then when it comes to the issue of re-exposure, I've read some anecdotal reports from Wuhan and other areas um, globally where they said they thought somebody may have been reinfected, but also it was so close. So again, when you, when you start to peel down the layers, it's kind of like, you don't really know, do you? And we have to say, yeah, we don't really know for sure. Or we can't give you... Uh, assurance with this. But in this day and age, in this day and culture, we want everything right now. And we want 100% certainty. And we want somebody to tell me that if I go out with a mask, I'm not going to get infected. Or if I, you know, have these antibodies, I can have sex and be intimate. And I don't have to worry about anything or I'm not going to sh shed virus to anybody. And the fact of the matter is, is that we can't guarantee that. Um, I yeah. can't tell you if you go out and go to a bookstore and give somebody head in a glory hole, I can't give you a percentage and say, oh, well, you could get chlamydia or you could get gonorrhea, or you could get syphilis. The fact is you could get all three or one of all of them. Or nothing. You don't know, right? <laughs> That's exactly. So you, don't, you don't know, but I can't give you numbers. I can't always give you percentages. And so hmm. it's okay as medical providers to say, I don't know. And it's also okay for people to hear that message and say, you know what, as with sexual health, if you, if you have some baseline education about what may be protective and the best that you can know right now from the science, then you can make that personal decision for yourself about what level of risk you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And so for some people going out in a pool right now and congregating with a whole bunch of people really close to you or going out to a bar or restaurant, they don't feel that that's going to be particularly risky to them. Others are just staying cooped up in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the same way with sexual behavior too. But I think as long as we try to give people the most up-to-date information, tell them what we do know um, and that what we are certain of, and then also acknowledge what we're not certain of, and then we can hand it to them and say, look, this is the information. It's up to you, but there's no 100% guarantees in this equation. Yeah.
You, I, I think I that have... also that um, the question becomes what we are willing to accept as risk for ourselves and then for other people. So like if say somebody um, is, you're very, maybe you live in the same building or the same house as your, your elderly grandmother, that's, an, that's a, a factor to kind of take into account. Um, right. Maybe you live by yourself, maybe you don't have as much risk or do, what do you do for work? These kinds of things, who are you around? So it's to asking about, yes, what risk am I willing to take? And then what risk am I willing to put others in? Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's, that's an important part of it, but there's no, absolutely no clear cut evidence. I think that's a crucial point to be made that we don't, we can't, even in medicine, any doctor or nurse will tell you, we look at guidelines and recommendations. And what does that mean? Like we can say for anything, you, you name it, for, for aneurysms, for, for <laughs> syphilis, for anything. You and I, and I, and in clinical practice, you can have somebody who says, here's what the guidelines say, but I see this person sitting in front of me in my clinic, in my exam room. And you know what? I agree. I think that's right, but not right now. This is what we need to do for this. So I think that that's what we're all trying to kind of get across is, you know, the way I see it is, is a harm reduction is, is an antibody protective? I don't know. It stands to reason it might be because other antibodies for other corona, other viruses are, are protective. Coronavirus seems to be more stable as viruses go compared to, for example, when you, even influenza. We don't know. But I think that it's not unreasonable to kind of look at it. It's, is, 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 is the glass half full or half empty? I think those are the questions to look at and to say, okay, so if... I, um, if I go, if I create a, if I have a sex party, that's going to be high risk. If I have sex with somebody who has an antibody, it may be a false positive. It may be actually inaccurate. It may be true. It may be that this person is immune from a future infection for a few months, for a year, for two years, who knows? We don't know, but that could become part of a harm reductionist calculation with all the problems that go with that because so many people will then say, oh, well, I'm clean. And we, we've already had that discussion and that's never appropriate to kind of go that route. So, so we, some, the unknowns right now, I mean, it sounds like almost everything is an unknown um, other than there is a virus out there, but uh, it sounds like we still don't quite know for how long after is someone infectious. And another thing is, if the antibodies do grant us immunity, for how long? Is it a permanent immunity? Does that taper off? I want people to get that that is also an unknown. It's unknown. You know, I have a, a, a bunch of questions I would love to get through. So if I could do sort of, sort of maybe a lightning round, just so I could get a few things answered that I know a lot of uh, gay men are saying. So one of them is, and I, I'll give you my understanding, my layman's understanding of this, uh, and then I'd love to hear what you have to say about it, but I am encountering gay men online, on Facebook, on apps that are saying, oh, it's okay, I'm on PrEP, because PrEP is you know, pre-exposure prophylaxis against a virus. And I just tell them, I'm like, first of all, Remember how the thing that makes HIV difficult to treat is that it's such a rapidly mutating virus? Like, first off, let's keep in mind that if you have antibodies to COVID, well, could COVID not mutate? In fact, my understanding is that here in New York, it has already mutated to a much more contagious and a much more lethal version. And that strain is now the dominant strain. So you have to expect that like it can also mutate. So, but secondly, HIV, here's my understanding. HIV is a retrovirus. COVID is a coronavirus. Why would an anti-retroviral give you protection against a coronavirus? So is that, would you say that that's, uh, what would you say to people who, who, who assume that PrEP gives them protection? So there's no data that shows that uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis with any of the currently FDA-approved agents provides any protection against COVID or uh, SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. Well, for that matter, I mean, people who, who are on PrEP or on treatment for HIV, which is usually involves the same medications as PrEP, still get herpes and flu and other viruses. So I think that just that logic doesn't make any sense. There's been, there had been some discussion about whether tenofovir could, could uh, be kind of helpful in preventing or treating uh, COVID. There's zero data on that that I've seen. Um, yeah. I know there's a study that's they're trying to ramp up, I think in Spain uh, on Spain. that. Yeah. Um, yes. And 
Um, you know, the, the trials on uh, protease inhibitors, so like um, lopinavir, ritonavir, that hasn't panned out either. Um, so I think I would first say to people, you can read, you can read it. If you read, if you read online, we've had a cure for HIV that's going to happen tomorrow for the last 20 years. So I don't really, I have patients that come to yes. me and say, what do you think about this today? I said, I've learned to not really be, get too excited yet. So with this, I, I would say to the first, the person first is if, if PrEP, not for your amtricitabine was truly able to prevent this virus, then it, why wouldn't it prevent other viruses and yeah. people still get coronaviruses on PrEP all the time? So that's, yeah, no. And I, I think one of the reasons behind why people have been thinking that way is because a lot of the studies have not found that living with HIV is a risk factor for COVID acquisition, hospitalization, or death. And so mm -hmm. some people are thinking, well, maybe there's some kind of cross-reactivity. But the answer to that question is that we just don't know. The tenofovir study is happening um, in Spain. I think Prezista has been tested, and that hasn't really done anything. And then Calitra has been used in a couple studies, one by itself and then one with two other antivirals, comparing it to just by itself. And it worked when it was, with, when it was paired with two other uh, retrovirals on shortening the duration that people were in the hospital. But when it was by itself, it didn't really help that much. And so the short answer to that question would be, we don't know, but right now it's, it's a no, but we don't know. Can I ask just as a matter of semantics. So when I say, well, a coronavirus is not a retrovirus. There are two different categories of viruses. Is that necessarily true? Is there ever overlap? Are some retroviruses coronaviruses? No. no they, work, they work with different enzymes and yeah. kind of reproducing. And as far as like, and a retrovirus works opposite of what we typically see with the genetic code from transferring from DNA to RNA. It's RNA to DNA. So we see these things kind of changing in a, a retrovirus works kind of opposite the replication cycle, cycle and enzymes that typically uh, viruses use when they, you know, reproduce within a host cell. Um, and so as far as we know, it, it shouldn't confer any kind of protection like that. Now, does it? Could we find something in the studies? It's possible. We could find something in the studies. We don't know. Um, but right now, there's no data that's actually suggesting that antiretrovirals, whether it's PrEP or for treatment, will work in protecting one or treating one for COVID-19. So another, another point that I'm hearing come up a lot from some gay men um, is that there really are people who still think, oh, this, this only affects people who have compromised immune systems or they're old or they have underlying conditions. There are people out there who are saying to me, they're like, I am healthy. I have no underlying conditions. So I, a two part question, is there any truth to the idea that someone with no under, which I don't know if I've ever met a human being with absolutely no underlying conditions of any sort, but if there is hypothetically someone who's young, has the uh, immune system of a bull, and they have no underlying conditions, can they assume either they won't get it or that if they get it, it won't really affect them, it will kind of come and go, or at least it won't kill them. And the other thing that I want to ask is, um, uh, I just uh, forgot that question. So I'll let you answer the first part of it first. I think that um, there is truth to some extent to that kind of mindset. If you just look at the numbers, the vast majority of people who get very sick tend to have some of these underlying conditions. We can go into the roots and the causes of those underlying conditions beyond just like, you know, structural violence, racial discrimination, all that. But um, there is some truth to that. Now, you can, of course, you're going to read there are a lot of people. There have been many cases of young, healthy looking, healthy people that are getting sick. Um, yeah. So that's again, this is there is no there's no black and white. Um, and then I think the, a different part of the question is to say, you know, I think I actually personally have, I, I have no underlying conditions that I know of. Um, I, I'd like to think I'm young um, and, and I have a good immune system. I got it. Um, I didn't get very sick. I just, I, did, I had that loss of taste and smell for a few weeks. And this was back in March when people weren't quite sure if that actually meant it. Now we know that that's what it is. And my antibody came back positive. So I looking back, I know that did happen. But now I'm thinking like, oh, well, I had it was there at that time that I didn't know that I was passing it on to somebody else when we were still trying to learn all this. So I think that that's another important question to say is, okay, maybe you may not get it. You may be one of that 20 something percent that is totally asymptomatic and never knows you have it. 
-hmm. and you're spreading it around, you know, to the grocery store, not even talking about sex partners to the, to the literal lady at the grocery store. Right. So I think that that's important to put that into the calculus of what people are doing to think, yes, you may be young and healthy. Um, but you could still get it. People still do get it. Maybe you don't have symptoms. And that in some ways is almost worse because then you're thinking you're fine. And then if you're with that mentality, you might be out there saying, you know what, I'm going to go to the club and, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be fine. So it's, there's, there's, it's that gray area. Uh, I just remembered the other part of the question that I wanted to ask. So, um, gosh, this was back in early March. I interviewed uh, Dr. Priyamba the Nike about this. And she was saying that like, the risk factors are not only underlying conditions, and I forget her statistic on this, but she said another huge risk factor. She's like, if you drink a certain amount of alcohol per week, it automatically puts you at risk. And I forget exactly how she said this. David, I don't know if you uh, had this conversation with her or remember this, but I don't think it was a matter of it makes you more likely to get it. But, and the, the amount of alcohol she was talking about was, she said, if you have two drinks or more per week, I don't know any gay men who drink, who drink less than two in a week, um, that if you have two drinks or more in a week, normally that wouldn't be such a big deal, but that does stuff to the, I forget what, what exactly it is, but that does stuff to the blood vessels in your lungs that basically makes it so that if you did get COVID, this would ravage your lungs. So it's not making it more possible for you to get it, but if you do get it and you are a regular moderate drinker, it's highly likely that this is gonna do a lot of damage to your lungs. Does anyone have any, any information on that? I, I don't, um, not that I've heard, I'm trying to think of like alpha one antitrypsin or some kind of enzyme that maybe happens in the liver and in the lungs that we can discuss mm -hmm. there. But I, I haven't read any studies regarding to that because even with conditions like asthma or COPD, which you would expect uh, because of the way uh, coronavirus, this new coronavirus has attacked the lungs and you know caused problems with oxygenation, that those people would be at higher risk, but that hasn't even panned out either. So you know, I would defer to you know, Jason or Jeffrey if they know anything about yeah. That, but I haven't, I haven't heard anything or read anything about it. Yeah, no, I haven't heard anything. Well, you know I what? I, I have that statistic on her podcast episode. So I should go back and like take a sound bite from that and insert that in here. So at least oh. I, I have that answer. So the thing with alcohol is you can, you can actually go, um, you can go to my, uh, my Facebook page and there's actually a link to an article and I can email that to you if you want. And it's mm -hmm. a great review article. So most people don't realize that chronic alcohol very clearly increases your risk of ARDS. And there's a whole slew of biomechanical uh, uh, things that happen to cause that. And here's just a simple list of that. The reason I know about it is I trained at Emory and the Emory docs, my mentors are the ones that first figured this out. So the larger issue is that what I'm telling people is I'm just telling people, look, drastically cut back on it or just abstain from it. There's no nutritional benefit to alcohol, right? I mean, it's very easy to want to drink right now if you're home trapped at home with the kids and your husband and your wife and all this stuff and you don't really have an outlet, but just realize you are increasing your risk of ARDS and you can go over the details of that on my Facebook page. Uh, so uh, I, I want to think of uh, other questions that I had in the meantime, but let, let me, here are two other questions that I have since they're on my mind. Let's say that I mean, it's only been like 75 days that I've been sheltered in place. Um, let's say that I went on Grindr, I see a neighbor who's in my building and we're like, hey, we live in the same building. What if we just exclusively hook up with each other during this time? Would you agree that that is potentially safer? And if someone were hell bent on picking one partner, what would be the most harm reductive way to go about doing that. I mean, that does sound safer just because it's fewer people, fewer mm -hmm. partners. Um, I, I guess I hesitate to say like, what are the criteria? Cause I don't want people to say like, Oh, the nurse practitioner said, let me check these boxes. And then you're, you're a clean person, right. good person because he right. said you, you have the antibody, you had it. Da, 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 da. And then of course we know people, 
men lie. Um, people will say, oh, you know, I, I definitely had it. Well, they didn't, but they had a cold. They say, they say, well, and then when you're in the middle of having sex, and they say, well, so how was, what was your test like? They say, oh, well, I had this cold like in March, and that was it. And you're like, well, wait, what? So I think that it's, it's, it's uh, again, goes back to kind of looking at it as a harm reduction is to say, you know, what is this, what are, what are the risks to me, to the other two people around me, and what is my particular situation? Um, so I think that if you say this is one person and we're going to kind of hook up somewhat exclusively or exclusively, um, that's going to put you just at less risk because you have fewer partners and fewer exposures. And maybe maybe that means you you and this other guy are able to really kind of help each other fulfill the needs that are going on right now. And then maybe you eat, both of you won't have as many other partners, which then in itself is reducing risk. So in that sense, I think that that sounds like a better idea than just saying like, I'm going to have a lot of partners. You know what? And I also think uh, sort of if you, if you go with that scenario that you've just described with somebody that you kind of know, or that you have a, Maybe if it, even if it's an informal relationship, that might be a little bit also better in terms of having a better communi- you know, maybe a more honest communication than something that you may not necessarily know where they where they've been or who they've been in contact with. But if it's somebody that you you know, it's it's show who lives two doors down. I see him all the time. We've known each other for five years. Like we can have a conversation, and he says, "Hey, I haven't you know I've been, I've been at home. Um, can we get together?" You know, again, I think it, it's it's a uh, it would be um, prob- that would probably be uh, potentially a little less. Yeah. Than, than, but again. Even even just like meeting somebody on Scruff or Grinder or whatever, and you're talking for two days, four days, a week or two, and you kind of get to know each other a little bit more, that is always going to be less risky whether COVID or gonorrhea or any of these things, then somebody who, you know, you're just, you're horny at one thirty in the morning and you like, you hook up and you never know what this person's last name is or type of thing versus you start talking to somebody, you really get into it. And then you can kind of sense it like, maybe this person isn't somebody that I feel comfortable with versus, okay, maybe this is somebody I feel comfortable with. And maybe it becomes, you know, something that's a little more regular. And then you, like I was saying, maybe you all, the two of you, help each other out kind of kind of get through this so i think it's again going through this whole kind of process of i think it's great that the apps are still open and i think that the apps are always have always been just i think neutral people i have people who are very judgmental say you should never be on those apps it's all like whores and and stis and they'll say stds and all these things i'm like well i also we all know husbands who've been married five years ten years that they met on grinder or scruff so it is what you make of it Exactly. And I think that you can, you, can, you can look at it and say, okay, well, this person lives near me. We're, we've been chatting. We've been chatting. We find out of what he does for his life and like how is, you know, and you have a better connection. And that's probably less risky than the hookup that you meet even at a, at a park or at a bar or wherever than this person you've actually gotten to know a little bit more. Now, they may be lying. Who knows? But we got to live our lives. I always say the same thing about the apps. Uh, people will, you know, the kind of things I talk about on the apps, like, you know, on on, on uh, Grinder, you get less than a tweet to say what you want to say. Which just side point: when people use, I'm like, you get 140 characters, and you're gonna use that to say like something racist. I'm like, right. You get 140 characters. The most precious thing for you to say was no, these guys or no that. Like, that tells us so much about you. I mean, you get 140 characters. That's what you <laughs> used it for? I don't get that. I don't get that. But on my Scruff profile, I always want to link people to my Scruff profile or publish it or perform it as a one-man show. But there's so much I say in there about like racism and about like sizeism and and slut shaming and a lot of things that I say about uh, sexual health. And people all, will always say like, no, this isn't the place. I'm like, this is actually exactly the place for those conversations because this is the where it plays out. But people will say, they're like, this is a sex app. And I'm like, actually, it's not. It's an app. It's just an app. It's an app that connects men who are attracted to men, period. Yeah. That's all this is. 
we make it what it is. A app, an app does not have a fixed way of being. This app is not inherently trashy or lewd or fast. It's just an app. We make it what it is. Um, I wanted to ask uh, another question, sort of along the lines of uh, two people having a kiki or a kai kai. So uh, as far from you can get, as far as you can get from that, my family, it's not, my, 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 my mom lost her dog who, uh, he, he was almost 18 years old and uh, it's just been so long we've had that dog that like, it is, a, it is a very palpable loss right now in our family. And my parents were saying like, we'd love if you could come out for a visit, if there's any way to do that. Now my parents are sheltering in our lake house in the North woods of Wisconsin. They're not exactly in quarantine. They'll be like, oh, you know, we had your aunt over for dinner. And I, I, to me, like, I live alone. I had a friend who was staying with me for a spell. And after two days, I was like, I love you. You got to go. Like, I'm, the math I'm trying to do for, like, I'm accounting for where I've been and what I've touched and who walked too close. People will walk so close. I'm like, have you not watched any new? But, like, having to try to do that math for two people and I don't know where you've been or what you've touched or how I was like, it's panicking me. So I, I, I assume they're being safe ish, but the question is if someone has a family thing and they have to travel and they have to go see family harm reduction wise, what would you say is the safest way to go about that? What safeguards do they need to put in place? What conversations need to be had? What mode of travel would you suggest is least risky? You know, for me, I think doing all the, the regular precautions that we're advising people to do. So, um, you know, wearing a mask if you're gonna be in a close environment where you could be close to a lot of other people uh, within coughing distance or something like that. You know, having some hand sanitizer on you, um, you know, maintaining some physical distance of space. I mean, I think during these times, people are understanding that um, we may not be able to hug because you can't account for where other people have been 100% of the time. You can only judge that for yourself. So like giving somebody an elbow and saying, you know, I'm going to give you the biggest hug when this is all over. I mean, ways of connecting that way that we kind of redefine uh, what this is. But I think if you have to go out and that's where it kind of, there's a middle ground to this. So it doesn't have to be the, you know, denial hysteria, which is this is a hoax that's made up to control our lives and, you know, infringe on our liberties. But it also doesn't have to be like, oh my God, I can't go out at all. I think we can use some common sense and know what we know about the virus. And there's still a lot we don't know, obviously, but we do know some things. And all you have to do is look at the epi. Uh, for the cities and the states that actually incorporated physical distancing stay-at-home orders to see that that shit works. Like, it, it works. It was going high, and it could have been a lot worse. And hell, if we had actually implemented this two to three weeks ahead of time, there are studies that say we could have reduced the number of deaths by anywhere from thirty to 40,000. And so, you know, I think when you're going to meet other people, do what you can to maintain some distance and your safety and even masks, and then you can still have a good time and just find other ways to connect. And whether that's a touch on the shoulder or a touch on the elbow, um, or if you have gloves and giving somebody a pound, I mean, there's other things you can kind of do. Is it going to minimize the risk 100%? Are there 100% guarantees for this? Absolutely not. But there are ways that you can still connect with people physically and be close to them and close proximity to them and try to minimize the risk that you have of, uh, being, uh, of contracting the virus. I, I can't imagine... Um... You know, I was saying, my dad was suggesting that I come for a visit and I thought, well, maybe I could rent a car and just drive there. I mean, this, we would be talking like a 18 hour drive, which is nothing for me, but um, he's like, no, 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 don't be ridiculous. Just fly in and I'll pick you up. You know, flying isn't that unsafe. Not a lot of people are flying. To me, that just sounds like I was going to go and eat my lunch in a hospital today. That, so that sounds to me like the, the, a big risk to take. But I think I assumed when I went to see my family that, of course, I would hug my parents when I see them. I, I kept thinking, oh, I can't wait to give my mom a hug. But when I think about that, it's like if I'm just coming from a flight and I just came from New York City from an airport, I think like you're saying, I'm like, I should make sure if I do see my family, 
I should be so lucky that I can be six or seven feet, I say seven or more feet away from them. When I feel like I should get it through my wig right now that like hugging them would be the absolutely off limits because for all I know, I might not be symptomatic. Maybe I picked it up in the airport, gave it to them, and then I leave and a week later I find out she's not doing well. Yeah, that's the harm reduction. I think that it's not unreasonable to say it's, it'd be less risky to take a car than it would be a plane. It'd be less risky to take a train than a plane. Um, you know, a lot of airlines have been saying they're, they're kind of keep the middle seat open. Then you read stories where they had a full airplane. Um, <laughs> So it, 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 again, becomes kind of a bit of a numbers game. Um, flying would be higher risk. Driving by yourself would probably be practically zero risk-ish. I mean, you, yeah. you could say, well, at the, at the, at the counter, you're going to go to the airport to pick up the car. Well, okay, yes. So that's, that's weighing all those, all those things. And I think we do that same calculus anyway, I think, when we just live our lives. So I think that is it something that you could see your family via Zoom and that's good enough? Is there something going on in your family that you need to be there physically? There's no right answer to that. And so I think then you have to kind of look at the harm reductionist and say, okay, well, I'm really concerned because my, my father is, has COPD or he's diabetic and he's 70 years old or whatever. And that's a higher risk. So maybe I'll take a car. Even if he says, no, I'll just take a car. That, that, that's, that's less risk. I'm coming from New York. I'm at a higher risk than if, say, you're, you know, somebody who's watching is from rural Idaho and they want to go see their family in Utah. That's probably a whole lot less risk than New York City to going to Philadelphia or something. Yeah. Right? So everybody has, and there's what works in New York isn't going to work in Idaho necessarily. You know, so I think we all have to make those calculations. I hate to say it, but just, just thinking, this out, th- thinking this through out loud with you all, it just doesn't, it strikes me now as like, you know, it, it, we're, they're talking like in a month from now, like by the end of, of June. And I'm just thinking like, that just does not sound like a smart idea. Hardly even for my sake. It, it sounds like that would be a really risky thing to do to my family. So maybe I'll have to have that conversation. You know, this is a, a bit off topic, but uh, I once was in sort of like a gay men's group therapy. And um, one of the guys was crying and so the other guy, because he just had a breakthrough, whatever, and one of the other guys went to touch him on the shoulder. And the therapist said, remember, we have an agreement here that we do not touch each other. And he said, I want you to think about what did you intend to communicate to him with that touch and find a way to put that in words instead. Um, now, to a point, I'm like, there's certain things that just can't communicate what touch does because we need touch. But also, my mom... Uh, she uh, runs a cheesecake company in Wisconsin, like you do. And she once had this man come into the store and he was an Orthodox Jewish man. And I forgot what happened, but somehow she like went to shake his hand and he's like, I can't touch a woman who's not my wife. And she's this little Midwestern lady. She doesn't know anything about this. But the more they talked, my mom said, she's like, I just think that you are so cool. And God, I wish, I just wish I could give you a hug. And he said to her, consider yourself hugged. And I love that because it's like you just hugged someone through language, you know? Um, And so I've been saying that with people and doing that for people. You know, I had a friend who used to text me on Facebook Messenger and he would just write hug with like 30 G's at the end. It felt like a hug every time it came. I mean, not exactly, but it, it gave me that same sense of like, I am loved. Someone cares about me. And we can do that. I mean, I, I had a, probably the person who broke my heart the most was a guy who lives in Mexico city. Right. So, and I I'm around people around here all the time. And that relationship that I had was so profoundly close. We met physically twice, you know, and we just, we just had this, we all know this. You can, and you can have somebody that's your roommate that, Mm -hmm. you know, you feel no connection with and you can text each other and just doesn't mean anything. Right. So I think that we have to discover this is this is a way we're going to have to discover these what these connections look like. And again, going back to the topic at hand, sex is a part of that. And we need to figure out how that fits in into yeah. our lives. Um, Jason, I know you have another call in a few minutes and you have to hop off. I, I told him I might be a little bit late so I can do a few. Oh, OK, I was going to say, David and Jeffrey, would, would you be interested in staying on for an extra few minutes after that? If you have any other things you'd like to discuss? I could stay till eight. 
I have to. Uh, oh, oh, so you also have to go any. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so you know what, actually, uh, Jeffrey, since that makes you the next one to leave, I'll give you the floor to say, is there anything you'd like to say in closing or anything that hasn't been said yet? Um, sure. Just, you know, I think this is a very um, interesting time for all of us. And this is a time for um, a lot of uh, emotion and a lot of uncertainty that it brings up in all of us. And I think we just need to find peace and comfort in, in, in knowing that um, we're trying to figure out everything um, all together and that we are one community and um, stay safe and be healthy. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Jeffrey. Um, yes. And uh, uh, we'll say goodbye to you and uh, Jason and David. Um, I'll come back to you guys and say, um, uh, let me just let me go back to my list of questions and see if there's anything else that I didn't get a chance to go through yet that I wanted to ask. Um, so I've got that question. Uh, I've got that question. I've got that. Okay. Yeah, I think I've got maybe two last questions for you, um, or three possibly. So I'd love to discuss this second wave of COVID that we hear is coming. Uh, and the implications of that. Um, I'd also love to talk about the spread of COVID. I know people talk about, oh, social distancing, or if a guy is talking about coming over for a hookup, he'll be like, oh, it's okay, I'll wear a mask and gloves. But I think people are ignoring the fact that this is a thing that also spreads through contact. Like I try to, I try to compare this to like glitter or bed bugs, you know? Um, so, could you talk a bit about that, about how this thing is spread that people might not be thinking about? There was that, there was that study. Um, I saw something on a report on one of the news stations where they used some kind of fluorescent lighting and they showed people having dinner and one person had, you know, it on their hands and then it kind of tracked and through just what they were doing, like handing around utensils and doing different things, just showing how that lit up all over the place and everyone got some kind of level of exposure. Um, and I think one of the things that we've been kind of dancing around and talking a little bit about directly, whether it's about, you know, you going home to see your family or sometimes in intimate settings is that, you know, this gives us an opportunity to redefine what connecting and intimacy means um, and kind of rediscovering different ways to have sex, whether it be phone sex or video sex mm -hmm. or uh, sex within with someone who's adjacent to you but doing different things. Um, if you're using toys, making sure that they're clean or just kind of doing more erotic stuff on an intimate level that doesn't involve, you know, sucking and licking and penetration and all that kind of stuff. So I think there's ways we can do all that because people need to understand that, you know, if you're kissing or if you just touch somebody and you haven't really sanitized yourself and you grabbed a handle someplace else and got exposed to it and then just touched their skin, it doesn't matter if you took every precaution with everything else, they could get it that way as well. Or just by breathing or if a small cough or if they're speaking and some droplets come out of their mouth, they have to be careful with that as well. Yeah. So I think, it, I think it's about, you know, challenging people to find different ways. And I'm always about finding the, you know, the glass half full or finding the silver, silver lining in something like this. And I think this is a reminder to us to kind of rediscover, you know, different forms of intimacy outside of the quick nut. And I think you can use scruff, you can use grinder, you can use jacked for all those things. It's just a matter of what you want to do. Because if you want to just have sex, you can go out to a club, you can go to a gas station, you can go to a supermarket, or you can use an app. If that's your intent, that's what you're going to get. But there are ways that you can find other ways to get close and connect with people and not do that and still maintain a little bit of safety with that until we get into in the clear for all this, which we don't know when that's going to be in a few months or when that's going to be. Exactly. I, I think also it's just useful for people to just think of Brita filter from RuPaul's Drag Race season 12 and the talking and the spitting. Just keep that visual in your head as you remember <laughs> how this thing is spread. That's a good, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Any way to bring her back into this. Right. <laughs> um, hi, Brita. Hey, she's that's vegan true. now. So there's that. <laughs> Um, and, all, and, and what would you guys say to uh, what should we know about the second wave? Is this necessarily happening? Has it already started? I think it's, it looks different in different places, uh, depending on kind of how they did with the initial 
kind of wave and then how they're re reopening. Um, so I think it stands to reason that they're once things open up again, people who have had zero exposure to, to COVID could be exposed. Um, does, does the summer kill it? Does the heat kill it? We think, you know, that there's something to some sort of UV radiation that may, and this, and then also partly just being outside as opposed to inside cooped up was it just put people at lesser risk. You know, I, I don't think that people should be zapping their insides with UV light or whatever Donald Trump was saying, but um, uh, you know, I think, there's, there's again, a lot of unknown. Who knows what's going to happen in the fall? Could the, vi it, the virus can mutate it, in it, you know, even though it's relatively more stable, it could. We just, we can't, we can't right now on May, whatever today is, 25th, say it's going to look like this in July or August or November. We just don't know. Um, so I think it's going to, we just kind of have to see what it's like. There, there could be another wave. Um, you know, I just taken a survey of my own kind of people I know and uh, medical professionals I know, and some people think there will be, some people think there won't be, some people think there'll be something in between. Some people say it's going to look different in New York than it is in Texas, and it, so yeah, we, we're still. I think we're still learning. Yeah, it may not. It may not be like a huge peak, yeah. um, like we saw with the first wave, but it may be kind of like in Georgia right now. They had a little bit of peak, and then it came down. And then it's kind of plateauing and then maybe going up a little bit. So it may look differently for different states. Some states are just getting their first wave right now, as a matter yeah. of fact. So, you know, it is kind of one of those things where New York is talking about getting a second wave or New Orleans is talking about getting a second wave. And some of these states are just going to be on the first one. So I think it's going to look different for a lot of people and depend on the politics, depend on who's doing stay at home restrictions and depend on how concerned the people are about just looking out for themselves versus looking out for the larger public health good. Now, can I ask you guys, um, now, so I'm in New York City. Are you guys, where are you guys exactly also New York or? I'm in New York City. Uh -huh. I'm way upstate, like near Saratoga. Okay, so have we flattened the curve in New York City? Like where are we on the chart right now? Well, in terms of like, I mean, if you look at the, the statistics on people who've died, it's gone down to I think below 100 per day, which I mean, when you think about it, that's insane to say, it's great, we want we have less than 100 people per day die. I mean, when you yeah. stop and think about that, that's just insane. Yeah. Um, the, the case, the, the incidents that we know of um, is has definitely gone down. Um, but New York, um, some would say late, but has been kind of really locked down and, and people more or less have been kind of abiding by that. So we'll see what happens as things start to open up again. And I think that's, that's an hour by the hour question. But if you just look at the overall curve, it looks like New York City for what it's worth at this snapshot in time has really gone down um, to a good space. But we'll see what happens as it starts opening up again. Would you say, does that mean that our hospitals are no longer overwhelmed? I think by and large, yeah. Um, I mean, it's definitely still a thing in inpatient yeah. um, and people who are coming in or who are who are very sick are very sick and they need the, the ventilators and also. But I think it's I think it, it can definitely be said that we're in a better place today than we are at the beginning of April. You know, what really uh, scared me was the idea of, I mean, I, I don't think I really knew until now. I just assumed that hospitals are still packed and they're making makeshift rooms and splitting ventilators between two people, um, which is not a thing. Like, apparently you can't actually really do that, but they've had to. Um, but I was thinking like when I go out for a run at night, I thought if I fall and break my leg, I guess I'm just going to have to crawl back home and set it myself. Like there, there is nothing like, I, 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 and, my, and maybe I'm exaggerating, but the way I thought about it is like, if anything happens to me, there's really nowhere to go because the hospitals are at capacity right well, now. It depends. It depends even where you were in New York City. Um, I think right now we're not really like that anywhere in the city as far as I know. Um, but I, I guess I can use this as my last, I actually have to get going, but my last little soapbox is to say, um, I think this is a good opportunity for people to really look back at their primary care and to say, you know, I, my, I've never, I don't do inpatient. I don't, I'm not managing vents, but my bread and butter is really helping people with their blood pressure, with their cholesterol, getting the viral load to undetectable, getting, mm -hmm. um, you know, their, their, uh, their COPD under control, quitting smoking, all of these things that we kind of 
I've been harping on my patients for years. Suddenly now they're like, oh, I want to, I want to fix that. That's great. Let's fix that. But that is so important because you've, we've heard so much about the, the comorbidities, which we're still trying to figure out, but many among which being diabetes, blood pressure, um, uh, you know, uh, life habits that maybe put someone at higher risk that could be changed. Um, I think that that's really important then to say, you know, when I, when I say to somebody, look, I would really love to help you quit smoking. It's not that I'm trying to be mean or not that I'm trying to be judgmental. It's that right now, look at what's going on. Someone who has really kind of torn up lungs, they're at a higher risk of, of complications. And it's almost a little bit too late to do anything about it now, but maybe, you know, maybe someone quits smoking now. And then in a second white wave that happens in September, they get it, but now their lungs are healthier than they are now. So that's going to always be a good thing. So I think it's just important to really take care of your overall health. We're not at a point now where you have to say, if you break your leg, you can't, you shouldn't go to hospital. You should go to the hospital. Um, but I think that we are, we are saying, I see a lot of many of my patients, although not all, but many via video visit. And we're still, you know, I have a patient that we were managing his quitting smoking. You know, he's, he's, I prescribed him the patches and I said, I want to see you in video in four weeks and we're going to see how you're doing and, and so on. So um, we, we just got to keep that going. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I, I, it bothers me so much when I see people outside with their mask off for, and they're having a cigarette. And I'm like, if, yeah. if, if this isn't going to bring home the point that maybe you should take care of your lungs and I don't, I don't know what is. Well, Jason, thank you so much for joining us and for uh, sharing all your information. And um, David, I'll keep you on for a, a minute, even if just to say goodbye and wrap up with you. Sure, sure. Okay. Bye, Jason. It was a pleasure. Thank yep. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, I think his, his, Jason's point was a good one with, with regards to, you know, people taking care of themselves. Because my friend that I told you the story about that was really scared of telling other people because he was afraid yeah. of the judgment. He also struggles with diabetes. And his sugars had been in the 300 range. And when a good friend of ours who was overweight and had diabetes got on a ventilator and ended up dying, and he was only 40 years old, um, it sparked something in him where he started cutting down on a lot of stuff and taking care of himself a little better. And he'll text me his, um, his blood sugars from his glucometer, which are now in the like 140s, which is absolutely phenomenal. So it's just, it's one of those things where I think you know, this is a wake up call to a lot of us. It depends on what you want to learn from this. I think we could take the glass half empty approach and just kind of be complaining about it all the time and how this has been a disruption and it's disrupted all of us in some way, shape or form, or we can take it as a learning opportunity and say, well, how do I move forward from this? And I think that's a more positive approach to take. You know, people always say, is the glass half empty and or is it half full? I say, that's not the question. The question is, is there an open bar? <laughs> right Absolutely. if it's an open bar it doesn't matter if it's full or empty it matters it um, actually my but, question is can i get a refill that's what yeah. i want that's what Are i want free refills um <laughs> i used to work at a restaurant in times you know in union square and refills were not free on soda but so many tourists coming from middle america are just used to free refills because they go to like <laughs> train restaurants and like, we would just get all of these arguments at the end. It's like, why are you charging me $30 <laughs> for soda? I'm like, cause you drank your weight in Diet Coke. Um, one last thing I want to ask is, um, you know, there's so many things that I'm hearing so much misinformation out there. And one of the things that I'm hearing people talk about is like why they're choosing not to wear a mask because wearing the mask is inherently unhealthy and you're breathing in your own CO2. I'm like, I mean, I don't think they understand how breathing works. If you think you're breathing in your own CO2 through a paper mask, like if you think a mask and a balloon are the same thing, I just don't know how to talk to you. But um, for people that say like, um, like, oh, wearing the mask doesn't protect you. And, and also I, I want to go up to people on the street who have their noses hanging out of them. And I just want to be like, I mean, they must know that their nose is hanging out. I want to ask them like, you must know something I don't. Please educate right. me. So right. what would you say to people who have fears about masks or think that wearing a mask can be unhealthy? Yeah, I think a lot of it is, and I mean, what I tell people with masks all the time is that most of the studies have shown, and there are studies out of China that has shown that uh, people, you know, like globally or in that area, accepting masks and wearing masks a lot does help kind of hasten the curve towards, you know, getting rid of the virus and slowing down the pandemic. 
But we, I always tell people it's, it's not really, you don't wear a mask to protect yourself from other people. You wear the mask to protect other people from you, especially the cloth masks or the surgical masks or the other like homemade masks. Yeah. They are not like the official N95 masks that healthcare workers use to protect themselves from their patients who had COVID-19. When you're wearing a mask outside, that's in case you're asymptomatic or if you had some mild symptoms to protect you from kind of spitting or getting anything on somebody else. So I try to tell people with that, but I do think there's a psychological component to it as well. I think a lot of people are afraid of being smothered. I think a lot of people get very anxious when they have something covering their mouth and nose. And that's a real thing and I would never scoff at that. So I think people get really um, nervous about that stuff and say, well, I don't wanna wear a mask. Or I, I've heard stories where people say, well, I have a doctor's note that says that I don't need to wear a mask. And I'm kind of like, why wouldn't you wear a mask? But again, it's kind of, to try to get Americans to think uh, less selfishly and say, mm -hmm. this is not really about just your risk uh, mm -hmm. and what you could get from other people, but this is about you serving it as, a, as an example to other people to say, I'm looking out for everybody else because if I go here, I don't, and if I have COVID-19, I don't wanna give it to other people. Or if I get it right. from somewhere outside, I don't wanna come home. Like right now I'm living with my mother who is 73 years old. I don't want to bring something home to her. So of course I'm gonna wear the mask. It will protect me, not 100%, but it's much better at protecting other people from me than it is me from them. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, I went out running one day because you know, my building closed their gym, which I completely agree with, but my building's gym has Peloton bikes and like that was getting me together. <laughs> so I've had to shift a bit. And so instead, I mean, I'm a block from the Hudson River. So I've just been running along the Hudson. But the first day I went and di did that, it was like you had to wait in line to run down the, 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 the road, basically. Um, and, I, and then I started, and, and there were people still hawking and spitting. And I'm like, you just cannot do that right now. And this is before everyone was wearing masks. This was like maybe uh, uh, early, early to mid-March. Right. So uh, I... When I do, I do go out running as my main form of exercise, but like I exclusively go after dark. Um, easier to do that as a six foot one man um, or a six foot five lady, but uh, I still wear an N95 mask. I am alone at night running along the Hudson. Sometimes in a 45 minute run, I might cross paths with a single person. Would you say in that situation, I could? leave the mask off or like at least have it around my arm so I can put it back in as I go back into my building? Or would you say it's still a good precaution to wear the mask even as I'm running? No, I think you probably could. Like for instance, I've been going out and walking a lot. Um, I'm in a very rural area. So I'll go out and walk like five to 10 miles and I don't wear a mask because I'm not really seeing people and not really directly um, coming in close contact with people. Do I keep a mask on me? Yes, because there are some destinations where there's a corner store where I may want to go in and get a Gatorade mm -hmm. and there will be other people around. And a lot of the stores in New York are requiring people to wear the mask now. So for me, I think that is important. But if you're out in the fresh air and you're about, you're going to read a whole bunch of different things like, oh, it can become aerosolized and it lingers in the air for this amount of time. And I think you have to do what you're comfortable with. So my advice to you would be, if that makes you feel more comfortable to have the mask on and it's not bothering you, then use it. But do I think you're gonna be at high risk of contracting this novel coronavirus by walking outside or running outside when there's nobody around you? I don't mm -hmm. think that's high risk at all. Um, and so I think you could do away with the mask when you want to and have a reasonable amount of certainty that you probably won't come in contact with COVID-19. I'll tell you what, Doing a uh, high intensity interval training and doing sprints with an N95 mask on, uh, it has not been the easiest thing. And I can actually do a sprint and like really push myself. But once it's done and it's time for like the recovery from that, that's when I'm gasping for breath and I'm like, I have to take it off. So it is good to know that in a situation like now, if I were running like during the daylight and there's other other runners out there, I would absolutely have the mask on. Also, I just feel like I don't want to be one more person out in public without a mask to give right. the idea that that's okay. If there were other people around, I would have a mask on just for the social 
You, you know, it's funny. I live in this. Uh, I live in the second largest residential building in New York City, right. and um, uh, for for whatever reason, it's a very uh, like predominantly Asian building. I think there's two. Uh, John Jay College is here, and I forget which other one is here. There's two colleges, and I know a lot of students came here from China to go to school. So you see people wearing masks in this building regularly, and it's funny how when I see that as an American, it's so foreign to me. I'm like, I don't get the why. Why are they wearing? Oh my God! I, well, I mean, they've they, they've had to deal with SARS before, so they've had the thing yeah. is is that America has to realize that we've been very privileged to not have a huge pandemic like this. And just for context, you know, you're looking at a hundred thousand people dead from this novel coronavirus in three months. The flu season usually can knock out anywhere from thirty to sixty thousand in a whole year. And yeah. so, but in other areas of the of the globe people will have pandemics like this, whether it be Ebola, whether it be MERS, whether it be SARS, and they've dealt with that. And they've also kind of adopted this thing where it's like, it's all about the community. It's all about the whole and the broader public health uh, good. Americans, we're still stuck on this selfish mentality, which is like, you're infringing on my freedom. I'm not gonna do that. I don't need to do that, blah, 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 blah. And it's sitting there thinking to yourself, you know, it's not all about you, but that's the American way is that it's all about being selfish. It's all about what it's in it for me. And what you're seeing with this pandemic is that folks are being challenged, like to stop being selfish and think about someone else in your family. Think about the people in your community. And it's not just about you, but that's a very challenging thing for a lot of Americans because we, because we've been brainwashed to think that it's all about us. Yeah. As individuals. Yeah. <sighs> The, the idea that my well-being and my chances of getting out of being this princess in a castle for however many months, that it's dependent on what others do. And then I turn on the news and I see people like in my home state of Wisconsin going out to bar. I'm like, you really Love can't that. go out to a bar and eat and drink and socialize with a mask on. Like, it just, it just makes me think I'm like, this is, this might be it. I think I'm just going to stay in for the rest of my life. But I also am very <laughs> inspired by the creativity that's come of this. I mean, mm -hmm. would we be doing a Zoom call like this? Possibly, possibly given that it's me doing an interview and because I right. want to create a video. Right. But all of the drag shows that are happening online, the singers who are doing concerts online i mean like I, I, this i i wasn't i haven't had anyone over so that's why i haven't cleaned and this place is such a mess but like no honestly i see I, but it still looks I, great no it's just it's, <laughs> no i'm i'm gonna get to it but no i'm actually in front of a enormous like 12 foot wide green screen i've been right. turning my home into a production studio which funny enough before this happened in uh, late February, I was getting ready to go back on the road in tour so I could make some money. And I remember thinking, I'm like, I just don't, I have, I, I, every now and then I'll get this strong internal directive and they're never wrong. And I thought, I really want to find a way to not have to tour, to not go back on the road and to not have to worry about money and to justify just staying home for two, even three months and just getting this apartment in order and turning it into a creative multimedia studio. It's a bit of a monkey's paw wish. This is not how I wanted it to happen. But, <laughs> um, but it, it, I mean, it, for me, it was, oh, it was a perfect time to, to, to do this. But I am very inspired to see that, like, telehealth is becoming a thing. You know, and I have so many friends who are homebound or bedridden or otherwise disabled. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, they're saying, like, all the things we were told were never possible suddenly overnight. We're like, oh yeah, we'll just make the class available online. So uh, I, I, it's I really- It's all possible. It's, yeah. it's given us like a swift kick in the ass. Cause like I said, I've been, this is the fifth month. I've been on unpaid leave because of my family situation and kind of what's been going on up here. So I'm not even seeing patient, but I've jumped into a telemedicine portal. I'm doing virtual webinars, virtual podcasts, virtual everything. And these were things that, you know, we were kind of toying and dipping our foot in the water before. Coronavirus has just come over and just pushed our asses in the pool and been like, go ahead and get in there. It's sink or swim. And I think that, yeah. the, again, the silver lining from this is that we're all going to be challenged regardless of what field you're in, is to think a little bit more creatively and realize that there's more than one way to do your job. 
more than one way to make money um, and more than one way to provide a service to somebody yeah. that needs it. And to me, that's a blessing. And I'm actually excited about some of the change that we'll experience moving forward in all these fields. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I, I tour for a living with my solo drag show as a fundraiser for local LGBTQ and animal rights organizations. And uh, you know, I've done 148 uh, organizations in 73 cities in five countries. Uh, I always say I, I love statistics so much I became one. Um, but I, there's so many places that they're like, oh, we'd love for you to do a show for our organization. And I'm just like, I just don't know. Colorado is in the middle of nowhere. Like it's not on the way to anything. So the idea that now I could start doing that virtually and, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm very inspired by all the possibilities um, that, that uh, the, the creative implications of this. Yeah, and it's not to say it's going to be a replacement, right? What? It doesn't have to completely replace everything. Just like online books or audible books didn't always replace like paper books or online periodicals or journals or newspapers people still read the newspaper. So there's still a way to do both, but I think it just gives more options for people to do stuff, which again is a good thing. Yeah. Well, David, I think that's a good place to leave it. Uh, I really want to thank you for uh, your time and your expertise and the extra time you gave us at the end there. Um, I forgot to ask everyone for this in advance. I will put it in the, um, in the, the video, but would you like to tell people where they can find you if people want to find you online? Yeah, so I'm on a few different platforms. Um, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, uh, at D-M-A-L-E-B-R, and I'm, at, I'm, on, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, it's at my first initial D and the last name Malbranch, which is M-A-L-E-B-R-A-N-C-H-E. But just look me up, you should be able to find me on all three of those mediums. Very vocal, very opinionated, so oh, you'll get them out. Same. <laughs> when people say, they're like, oh, I follow you on Instagram, I'm like, do you do? Are we cool? Are we cool? Okay. No, I'm like, I, I feel some sort of way about how the world is. Uh, and I have very strong ideas on what should be, be done about that. Well, I'll put everyone's uh, social media in the video so people can see that as well. And uh, any, any parting words, any last thing you'd like to say to people? No, I just, I, I think it's been an honor to be on here with you. And it was great to have this discussion uh, with Jason and Jeff. And so I'm just honored. And so I think um, it's great what you're doing and being able to bring some uh, humanity to this and bring some angles to it, particularly for the LGBTQ community. And so that people can know uh, some of the facts and some of us that are working in the profession um, and are exposed to this stuff every day uh, mm -hmm. and hear about these things and read about these things and practice these things every day. Just thank you for giving us a platform to do this um, and kind of have this conversation. It's really a phenomenal thing. So sure. I'm just happy that you're as passionate an activist as I am. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I, it, feels, it feels like it's my responsibility. I, you know, I also, I don't have like the largest following in the world, but um, I feel like to the extent that I do have a platform, it's, it, it's, it comes with a responsibility. Like it's yep. my, you know, uh, uh, Day, uh, oh, the other two guys uh, were referred to me by our friend Damon, Damon Jacobs, who's a, a, a therapist. Damon's phenomenal, yeah. Oh, you know Damon, yes. Of course I know Damon, who doesn't know Damon? <laughs> who doesn't know Damon? Um, <laughs> we go way back, but he, um, he and I sort of uh, partnered on a prep project back when no one knew what it was. And um, what was I saying about that? Uh, yes, on my podcast, Big Fat Vegan Radio, I had never to that point done an episode that is completely a departure from animal rights or veganism. And I did an episode where I'm like, today we're interviewing this guy about PrEP and HIV prevention. And listen, I know that this is a departure from what we normally talk about, but I have this platform I'm going to use it to get the word out about this. So I do feel that like having a platform and having a public, I mean, it comes with the responsibility to, to use it for, for the, the greatest possible good. So Absolutely. thank you for that. I'm going to go rip this wig off to give my head a moment to <laughs> decompress because in a few minutes I'm doing another interview with someone. Uh, I'm a guest on someone else's show. But uh, thank you again for being here and, um, and keep in touch. Honey, I definitely will. Thank you so much again for the opportunity. Thank you, David. My pleasure. All right. Be well. Thanks. Bye-bye. Oh, my God. Oh.